We live in an attention economy. You'll hear people you respect say that they struggle to watch a whole movie anymore, especially without looking at their phone. And once they inevitably succumb to temptation, they're immediately confronted with so many fast-paced social media snippets and hyperbolic headlines that they're goaded into engaging. To combat this, filmmakers really need to grab an audience's attention and not let it go. So as the technology in your pocket advances, so must the visual spectacle of film. So we've started seeing larger set pieces, sweeping landscapes, and excessive CGI technology. This is all very effective, as long as you're dealing with fantasy, science fiction, or action. But how about a character-driven drama series? It's not so simple. Dramas are about relationships, they're mostly comprised of people walking into rooms and saying things, or seducing one another, usually feeling much more about the script and the actors than anything else. Which is why it's all the more impressive to say that HBO's Euphoria is the most visually compelling series on television right now. You may be able to point to other shows that have a visual feast here or there, or immaculate set design for a period piece, but Euphoria's consistently varied style and captivating colour palette elevates what could be just another teen drama into unmissable entertainment. Given Euphoria is the dark brainchild of writer-director Sam Levinson, he deserves the credit for pulling off something so stylistically ambitious, but let's not forget the five cinematographers who have brought their own technical brilliance to the show, particularly Marcel Rave, who shot 13 episodes. From what I can tell, there are seven keys that have become hallmarks for Euphoria's unique style. Let's start with active camera work. In Euphoria, the camera is always alive. It's very rare for it to be locked off in one spot unless it's for a specific purpose. Shots usually begin with a camera tracking in or out. Sometimes it's swinging by or even around. There's always a sense of momentum. We may start with a wide shot and end with a close-up. It could be an overhead angle or handheld if it's meant to feel more emotionally sensitive. The effect of this is that Levinson dramatizes the emotions of what we're seeing with the speed the camera moves. In this sequence, he utilizes shot reverse shot, except he tracks in fast in both directions, giving us more information with each shot. This gives us a sense of how dizzying the experience is for Nate with all the commotion around his family, and then Maddie arrives unexpectedly. He could have just shot this perfectly static, the family's getting some photographs and then Maddie comes over and starts the drama, but by keeping the camera active, it heightens the emotional intensity of the scene. Keeping the camera moving isn't exactly new, I've covered this in my Goodfellas video, about how Scorsese uses the camera to create a sense of being on an unstoppable trajectory. And Levinson's character introductions in Euphoria, particularly Fez's, feel like an homage to Goodfellas' visual style, with a more Brett Easton Ellis in Less Than Zero narration style. But whereas Scorsese favourite long shots, Levinson is using frequent cuts, which is maybe even more impressive, especially when it's for TV, not film, as it means they're setting up so many more ambitious shots, one after the other. And then to keep the momentum of the moving camera, the cuts are often match cuts, or panning cuts, where we fly off in one direction, hide the cut in the middle, and arrive in the middle of another moving shot. Next is intimate portrait shots. Most dramas love to use a wide establishing shot, and then basically ride out the rest of the scene in a comfortable mid-shot, where we see the character's upper body and face. They may even cut to a close-up or two if something juicy happens. Whereas Levinson chooses confronting head-on close-ups. These are portraits of each character that really help us to identify with them as we're seeing them up close, making them more human. He also utilises a very narrow, shallow depth of field for most of his shots. A shallow depth of field basically means that only a narrow area of the image is in focus, blurring out the background, in comparison to a greater depth of field where everything is in focus typically used for wide shots, or a medium depth of field, which most series utilise to ensure we get our characters in focus, and some of the surrounding environment as well. Choosing to shoot the show with a shallow depth of field unlocks the emotional experience of each character. When everything is in focus, our character is just a moving part of the plot, 
whereas when we focus intensely on just them, the set becomes secondary, and the lived experience of the character is enabled. The decision to put things into slow motion also communicates that how they feel about what's happening is more important than just what's happening, creating a more intimate connection with the viewer. Then we come to lighting, which is what most people immediately notice about Euphoria. It's an explosion of mood lighting, reds, blues, purples and yellows, each colour allowing the character and the audience to get lost in the romance of the moment. The parties are defined by neon lights, but notice the dreamlike lighting for the scene where Jules finds out who she's been texting. We have a mixture of white light, cooled off with subtle blue gels, mixed with yellow light, and there's actually surrounding yellow lights out of focus in the background too, and then adding all this fog creates this cloudy, dreamy, surreal atmosphere. Levinson also uses spotlights to highlight the isolated experience of each character, and lens flares to make the audience feel like they're personally in that scene, watching it unfold. Then we come to ambitious tracking. Now, as we discussed, there are plenty of tracking shots in Euphoria. Tracking walking, tracking cycling, tracking driving, so many captivating tracking shots that you almost take them for granted. But sometimes you have to appreciate the complexity and ambitiousness of a specific shot and how it elevates the experience for the viewer. Take this moment. Jules is reunited with her old friend, and they're excitedly hanging out together. We start off overhead, then once the door opens, the camera twists like a bottle cap to the right while crouching down. Then as they run up the stairs, boom, we swing behind them now and twist and track our way back up. Not just one, but two sets of stairs, like we're on a roller coaster. In the script, this might have just read as simply as Jules and her friend run up the stairs together, elated but Levinson turns it into something visually compelling. Or this tracking shot at the carnival that lasts for 76 seconds. We start off close to Rue and her friends. We lose interest in them as they walk away and track over to a mid shot of Maddie. Then once she storms off, we fly into the sky to catch another mid shot of Jules and Kat on the Ferris wheel. These wide transitions really adding to our understanding of the space and atmosphere of the scene. Then they lead us down to a close-up of Nate, who then rushes away, and we then close with a long shot of Nate and Maddie having an argument. Our attention is constantly being grabbed by new compelling information that keeps us hooked. Each of these shots are beautiful in their own right, but all being crammed into one ambitious tracking shot is simply spectacular. Next is creative transitions. Levinson loves to hide his transitions in panning and tracking shots whenever possible. That way he doesn't interrupt the flow of the action. But if he does have to cut, he makes the transition part of the visual storytelling. For example, we watch Rue and Jules' friendship and relationship blossom with these circular swinging tracking shots. Rather than showing us a clock ticking or a cliche calendar flicking, Due to the circular nature of time, with each swing around, we sense significant time passing, and given they were just at a carnival in that same episode, this subliminally makes us feel like we're on a merry-go-round, the characters clearly enjoying every turn. Or, using green screen and other trickery, we'll teleport the same character into a new location, like a crying child seamlessly transitioning from weeping in her classroom to her bedroom, conveying the misery didn't stop. Or check out this series of incredible transitions and cuts in Nate's introduction. We start off with a kid Nate, screaming as he works out, goes to the mirror and ducks down, and the camera flows through to the other side, where a grown-up Nate is still stuck in the same cycle of aggressive behaviour. Then boom, we cut to a football team, immediately swinging down to isolate Nate, to show what all of that working out and aggression led to. It can't be stated enough how much pre-planning it takes to execute this so seamlessly, but the entire camera crew consistently nail it. Then we come to composition. Euphoria is shot as sublimely as any high-level commercial I've ever seen. It's selling a lifestyle, selling clothes, selling sunglasses, selling a trip, a car, a fragrance. It manages to capture the essence of what it feels like to be alive and exposed to the world around you. 
Composition is so important because it's all about correctly choosing what goes into each shot and why. For instance, the famous shot of Cassie weeping, surrounded by all the roses Nate sends her in private, juxtaposes her emotional state with Nate's false promises. She's technically surrounded by symbols of what she wants, yet being part of this relationship only hurts her. But we all know that she's never going to leave. Which makes the shot instantly iconic, a prisoner of her own desires. When Cassie and Maddie take Molly, Levinson places them in a house of mirrors, as they begin to explore alternative sides to their personalities. On top of what and why, it's also about when to reveal certain information to the audience. Like this shot here, Maddie enters the house and we discover that Nate is already sitting in the corner with a gun pointed at her. However, it's a reflection in the mirror she can't see, so she goes and changes, each second raising the viewer's heart rate, for a full 50 seconds until Maddie finally realises what we've known the entire time. Moving shots are even more impressive, as Levinson reveals information to guide the audience's attention to certain obstacles. Like during Rue's run from the police, we have this shot unexpectedly in the middle with no explanation. A man sitting on a sofa watching TV. Then suddenly we tilt up to the action as Rue closes the shutter door, and then we pan to the next reality as she falls straight into police lights. It's an 8 second shot. We start in peace to show how life should be and normally is, then Rue acts as the antagonist, shutting the door on it, and is then immediately engulfed by police lights, catapulting us right back into the chaos of the chase. In just a quick 8 seconds, an emotional journey takes place for the audience in the middle of a chase. The final key is stylized mini set pieces. Not that it even needed it, as it already has so much going for it aesthetically, but Euphoria at any time can switch its whole style of storytelling as a sort of side feature. When Rue is trying to figure out what's going on between Nate and Jules, it transforms into a grainy detective noir story. Or when Lexi puts on a play, which is a whole new spectacle in itself, we're intercutting actual reality with the performances. There's also unexpectedly big budget set pieces, like when Rue gets too high in episode 1 and the room starts rotating, similar to Inception. Or at the end of season 1 when she retreats back into drug use, we launch into a choreographed dance sequence, echoing Michael Jackson's thriller. Levinson borrows from the best and seamlessly blends it into his unique visual style, with cinematographer Marcel Rave masterfully executing each idea. With so much going on, the banging soundtrack, the lighting, the tracking, tilting, zooming, close-ups, depth of field, it can feel like sensory overload at times, but it also captures the romance of being alive, especially at that age where you're still discovering things about yourself and the world around you. And while other content may struggle to keep your attention, Euphoria is so consistently inventive that it's hard to look away. And that's why it's the most visually compelling show on TV right now. If you enjoy content like this and want to see more of it, please do consider supporting me on Patreon, as it really does make a difference to how much content I can pump out. Or if you can't afford that, then simply like the video, subscribe, and leave a comment down below to help the algorithm do its thing.